line, Kimberly Sewell, come on, just clap your hands, Bianca. Come on, clap your hands, Melissa. Come on, clap your hands all over the sanctuary, all in our viewing sessions. Come on, let's just clap our hands and give God some glory. Clap them like you really believe it. Clap them like you have just been convinced that things are going to get. Clap them like you already know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Just before we get into the message for this evening, can you guys help me thank God for Elder Norman Jackson, for Elder Norman Jackson, amen, for blessing our hearts on last week. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, there's a word from the Lord today. Uh, I'm going to ask if you will pray with me uh, as we read these scriptures because there's some names in here that I may not pronounce like you pronounce. But if I read aloud while you read silently, won't nobody know if I'm wrong. <laughs> First Chronicles chapter number 7, 27, I'm sorry. First Chronicles chapter number 27, starting at verse number 25. First Chronicles chapter number 27. Verse number 25. When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, say hold on. I'm going to hold on. If you don't have a Bible and you're just going to listen to us, say, go ahead. Because we love you so much, you don't even have to tell us to go ahead. You can join in. We're going to have it up on the screen. Amen. So you can see what thus said the Lord and not what thus said the pastor. First Chronicles chapter number 27. Verse number 25. Are you there? Here's what you'll find. It says, and over the king's treasures was Asmaveth, the son of Idiel, and over the storehouses in the field, in the cities, and in the villages, and in the castles, was Jonathan, the son of Uzziah. And over them that did the work of the field for the tillage of the ground was Ezra, the son of Chelub. And over the vineyards was Shimei, the Ramathite, over the increase of the vineyards, for the wine cellars was Zebedee, the shipmate. And over the olive trees and the sycamore trees that were in the low plains was Baal Hanan, the Gedrite, I knew it was going to happen, Gedrite. And over the cellars of the oil was Joash. And over the herds that fed in Sharon was Shatron, or Shatri, the Sharonite. And over the herds that were in the valleys was Shaphat, the son of Adlai. Over the camels also was Obil, the Ishmaelite, and over the asses was Jediah, the Maranathite. And over the flocks was Jezeus, not Jay-Z, was Jezeus, <laughs> the Hagarite. All these were the rulers of the substance, which was King David's. Uh, can you go back and give me verse number 28 in the New Living Translation, please? And while he put that up, I'm going to read what it says in the New Living Translation. It says this, Baal Hanan from Jadir was in charge of the king's olive groves and sycamore fig trees in the foothills of Judah. Joash was responsible for the supplies of olive oil. Briefly, I just want to speak to you from this topic. Safeguarding the king's oil. Safeguarding the king's oil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now. For this day, for this is the day you've made, we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we ask now, God, that we have come to be assembled in front of you today, God, and now that we are here, God, that you would lend us your ear, Heavenly Father, God, as we bring our petitions before you. But God, even more so than that, God, even as I get ready to go into your word, God, speak through me so that your people will hear what you have to say. Speak clearly as only you can do. If there's one here today that doesn't know you in the free pardon of their sins, convict, convince, and persuade right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray now that you help me to teach and to preach your word with the Holy Ghost boldness, but not with an arrogance. Hide me now behind the cross so that the people will see none of me, but all of thee. And now may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. The story is told 
of a logging equipment salesman that was trying to sell a farmer a chainsaw. So he said to the farmer that this saw is guaranteed to chop down 50 trees a day. The farmer was impressed with what he heard, so he made up his mind to make the purchase. A week later, the farmer stormed back into the front doors of the salesman's office. He threw the saw down on the counter, and he demanded that he receive his money back. He said that there is something wrong with this saw. He said there's no way it can cut down 50 trees a day. In fact, it can hardly do three trees in a day. So the foreman grabbed the saw, he pulled on it, and the chainsaw started, boom, and the farmer jumped back. What is that noise? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, much like the farmer in this illustration, there are a lot of Christians in the church that have taken on assignments without realizing the power that is available to them. And then there are some who may realize the power that is available to them, but they simply don't know how to access that power. But Acts chapter number one, verse number eight, says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, and throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This morning, church, I've come to remind you of the power that is available to you from God by way of the Holy Spirit. And it is important for you to know that without that power, without the Holy Spirit, you and I are fighting an uphill battle that will ultimately end in defeat because the reality of it all is that we can do nothing in our own strength. Even Jesus, in his human nature, had to rely on the power and the Spirit of God to be effective in his earthly ministry. Okay, I got three people that believe me. Uh, the rest of you act like I'm making this up, so let me give you some scripture. Can you, can you put up Luke chapter number 3 for me, New Living Translation, chapter number 3, verses 21 through 22. I want you to see this. Here's what it says. It says, one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit, don't miss this, in bodily form, descended on him like a dove and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. It's a little bit more. Luke chapter number four, verse number one. Here's what it says. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Drop down a little further. Same chapter, 14th and 15th verse. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. You catching this? He, he, he's full of the Spirit. Uh, but then finally, watch this, Luke chapter number 4, verses 18 through 21. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Then he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogues looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. If these scriptures have not proved my statement to you, then I got one more. And after that, you just don't want to believe me. <laughs> Acts chapter number 10, 
verse 38. I didn't give you that back there, so you don't have to worry about it. Here's what it says in Acts chapter number 10, verse 38. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. I've used several scriptures to show you that Jesus even had to be empowered and anointed of God to handle the assignment on his life. And if Jesus needed the anointing, and if Jesus needed the power of God to be effective, there is no way that you and I should be arrogant enough to believe that we can do whatever we have been called to do without the king's oil. Even when you look throughout the Bible, you will see that it wasn't just Jesus who was anointed of God to do what he was called to do, but there were countless others. But for time's sake, let's look at David as an example in him being anointed of God to do what he was called to do. You know the story, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil. Go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse. He lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. Verse 13. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought, and he anointed David with the oil. Here's what I want to say, what, what, what I want you to see. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully from that day on. Then Samuel return to Ramah. Listen to me right here. Whatever it is that you are doing in the kingdom, if you have not been called to it, and if you have not been anointed for it, you will always be frustrated and disappointed by the ineffectiveness of your efforts because when there is no oil, there will always be friction and failure because of the frailty and the flaws of your flesh. And some of you are struggling like you're struggling because you're somewhere you shouldn't be. Some of you continuously get disappointed because you're trying it without the oil. Woo! Say it one more time. Whatever it is that you are doing in the kingdom, if you have not been called to it, and if you have not been anointed for it, you will always be frustrated and disappointed by the ineffectiveness of your efforts because when there is no oil, oil, there will always be friction and failure because of the frailty and the flaws of your flesh. In other words, it's hard to be productive when you are out of place. And it's just as hard to be successful when you are not led of the Spirit. And this is why I love this text that we have before us this morning. I know that many of you are still trying to figure out why I chose that particular text and what does it have to do with this message. Just a bunch of names. What's in a name? I don't know that point. <laughs> but if you're trying to figure out what this particular text has to do with this message, come, come along with me as we look at it again so that we can piece it together. Again, starting at verse 25. Asmaveth, the son of Adiel, was in charge of the palace treasure. Jonathan, son of Uzziah, was in charge of the regional treasuries throughout the towns, villages, and fortresses of Israel. Ezra, son of Caleb, was in charge of the field workers who formed the king's island. Shimei from Ramah was in charge of the king's vineyards. Zabdi from Shephram was responsible for the grapes and the supplies of the wine. Baal Hanan from Jadir was in charge of the king's olive groves and sycamore fig trees in the foothills of Judah. Joash was responsible for the supplies of olive oil. Shitri was from Sharon. He was in charge of the cattle of the Sharon plain. Uh, Shaphat, son of Aldi, was responsible for the cattle in the valleys. Obil, the Ishmaelite, was in charge of the camels. And then Jediah from uh, Maranoth was in charge of the donkeys. Jesus, the Hagrite, was in charge of the king's flocks of sheep and goats. All these officials were overseers of King David's property. If you are like me, when you come across passages of scripture like this, here in our text, you either read it very fast, or if you're being real honest, you skip over it and just go to the next chapter. But if you take the time to really read this text, 
and pay attention to its details, you will discover that there is a lesson in this list of names and job descriptions. This list is not comprised of people who went out searching for a job just to get out, uh, out of the ranks of the unemployed. But each of these individuals are officers that have been called to serve under the leadership of King David and his kingdom. And I want you to notice, if you will, that they all have an area of expertise. And they all serve in different capacities. I'm going somewhere. They, they, they serve in different spaces within the kingdom for the betterment of the kingdom. They all knew their assignments, and because of them knowing their assignment and because of their discipline to stay in their own lane, they are able to experience growth, productivity, and effectiveness with regularity. And while each job and each man is equally important and responsible for the growth and effectiveness within the kingdom, there's one job and one individual that I want to zoom in on, and that is the last job and the last gentleman that we see in verse 28. It says, Baal Hanan from Judea was in charge of the king's olive groves and sycamore fig trees in the foothills of Judah. Then it says, Joash was responsible for the supplies of olive oil. And the reason that I picked out Joash is because he is responsible for the oil in the kingdom. And as children of God and his kingdom, each of us, much like Joash, uh, is responsible for the oil or the anointing that flows within the kingdom. And the first thing I notice about Joash's assignment are the duties of his job the duties of his job. It says that Joash was responsible for the supplies of olive oil. He has been placed in a special service for the king. And get this, his job is not a flashy job. His job is not a job that's going to attract a lot of attention. And in all honesty, his job is one that is hidden away from the eyes of men. And because Joash was responsible for the supplies of the olive oil, one of his duties was to prepare the oil. And in preparing the oil, uh, watch this, he ended up working hand in hand or in close conjunction with the priest of his day. Uh, they, they were to manufacture oil according to the law of Moses. Uh, they, they were to be, there were to be no substitutes or anything left out of this oil that was made. And in Exodus chapter number 30, write it down, you don't have to go there, but Exodus chapter number 30, verses 22 through 25, uh, we see the specific ingredients that are to make up this oil. Here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, collect choice spices, 12 and a half pounds of pure myrrh, six and a quarter pounds of, of fragrant cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant calamus, and 12 and a half pounds of cassia, and measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel, also get one gallon of olive oil, and then like a skilled incense maker, blend these ingredients together to make a holy anointing oil. Don't sound like much, but this was important because in the Old Testament days, oil was very important for use in the Jewish society. They used this oil for religious needs. They used this oil for fuel for the lamps. Uh, they used this oil for medicine and et cetera, et cetera. And just as Joash was responsible for preparing the oil back then, you and I have a responsibility for the oil today. Uh, unlike Joash and the priest of his day, we don't have to prepare oil by mixing together pure myrrh. And we don't have to do it by putting together some fragrant cinnamon and fragrant calamus. But we prepare the oil when we receive Christ as our Savior. We prepare the oil when we are obedient to his word. We prepare the oil when we love our enemies. We prepare the oil when we forgive those who offend us. We prepare the oil when we treat our neighbors the way that we want to be treated. And once the oil is prepared, we will see that just as the oil was used for a plethora of things in the Old Testament Jewish society, it will also be used for a plethora of things in the kingdom today. In other words, you will discover that your oil is not just for Sunday morning use. <laughs> See, some of you don't want to tap into your anointing until it's your time to sing the solo. Some of you don't want to tap into the anointing until it's your time to preach. 
Some of you don't want to tap into the anointing until it's your time to pray. But when you understand this thing, you will understand that your oil is not just for Sunday morning use, but your oil will be used in your community to keep your light shining bright. Your oil will be used to change the atmosphere and the hearts of people on your job. Your oil will be used to reconcile and repair relationships in your household and among your family. Watch this. And no one may never give you the credit for preparing the oil, but that's okay because you're not out to try to please people, but you're out to make sure that the king understands you are taking good care and being responsible of the oil that he's put in your life. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Time out for reserving Saturday night to get back right with God. What you gonna do when you're running? I hear you, Brother Wilbur. What you gonna do when you're running to somebody on Tuesday? But you still smell like alcohol. Ooh, it's tight. What you gonna do on Friday night when you're running to them in the grocery store? And you smell like that sticky icky. And I'm a little concerned that you know what sticky icky is. <laughs> when God calls you, he never called you just for Sunday morning. And woe to the Christian who do what he want to do all week long and then want to consecrate Saturday night. Excuse me, Saturday morning, because you don't get in to about 12 or 1. Ooh, I ain't know we're going to get this quiet. Watch this. His duties were to prepare the oil, but his duties also required him to preserve the oil. He had to make sure that no one could come in and steal or corrupt the source of oil. This oil was stored in large vats, which is like a huge container that has a lid on it. This large vat would sometimes be sealed with a wax ring around the rim so that nothing harmful could gain access to it. He had to watch carefully to notice if any mold or mildew had began to grow on the lid. Watch this. He, he had to make sure that the wax did not crack with age and allow insects or rodents to fall into the oil and contaminate it. I just said something. The same way that Joash preserved the oil back then. You and I have a responsibility to preserve the oil today. Well, Pastor, how do we preserve the oil today? We preserve the oil by making sure that the oil of the Spirit is not corrupted by complacency, that it's not corrupted by compromise, that it's not corrupted by cowardice. We preserve the oil by making sure that it is not stolen by discontentment, that it's not stolen by discouragement, and that it's not stolen by disdain. First Peter chapter number 5, verse number 8, here's what it says. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Watch this. And when he comes to steal, he is not out to steal your title. He's not out to steal your skill set. He's not out to steal your position. But he's out to steal your anointing. And today, God is looking for individuals that will safeguard the oil. He's looking for individuals that will respect the anointing. He's looking for individuals who will prepare and preserve the anointing so that the kingdom of God will continue to advance in these last and evil days. And if we're going to safeguard the king's oil, we're going to have to have a mindset to know what our duties are. We have to know the duties that come with the job. But secondly... When we're safeguarding the king's oil, we also have to be mindful of the disadvantages of the job. Oh, you, you ain't interested in disadvantages, huh? See, the church loves to serve the Lord because he gives me favor. What is this word, disadvantage? Hold tight. Watch this. Verse 28 of the text. Baal Hanan from Judea was in charge of the king's olive groves and sycamore fig trees in the foothills of, Ju of Judah. Joaz was responsible for the supplies of olive oil. That's the New Living Translation, but we read the King James Version earlier. In the last part of verse 28 in the King James Version says, over the sellers of oil was Joash. The job that Joash has is not a job that gets a lot of recognition, which means that one of the disadvantages of this job 
is that you will often go unnoticed. Oh, I just heard somebody. You, you got in this thing to build your name. Woo! But, but a disadvantage to this job is that you will often go unnoticed. See, very few people ever saw Joe Ash or his men laboring under the task of treasuring this oil. Even when you go back in the text and read the list of men and their jobs, you will notice that many of the king's men uh, were those who were out front and quickly noticed by the people. They were working outside in the fields where they could be seen. They were seen working behind the counters and the desk in the palace handling matters of treasury. They were seen in the city and in the villages dressing uh, the vineyards. But Joash's job was not in the city. His job was not in the village where he could be seen or men. His job was not behind the desk or in the office of the palace where he may be seen by the king. But his job was in the cellar. Woo! I want to be used by God, but can you, you be used when he put you at ground level? Watch this. His job was in the cellar. And he may not have been seen of men. But his job was just as important. Because remember, in order for that kingdom to have the medicine, in order for the kingdom to have the oil they needed, the lamp, it, ha it all had to go through him. Not seen, but very much needed. I'm going somewhere. He, he, he was the reason, watch this, that people were able to be anointed with oil in religious settings. He was the reason that shepherds had oil to put on their sheep. But because his job was done in the cellar, it went unnoticed by the people. Because his job does not have him out front. He doesn't get the credit that he deserves. And much like the job of Joash, there are a lot of people here that have been producing, preparing, and preserving the oil that has been impactful and effective in the kingdom. Producing oil that has been impactful and effective in the church. Producing oil that has been impactful and effective in your family and on your job. But because you're not in the forefront, it goes unnoticed by the people. Okay, let me see if I can help you. On Sunday morning, the people see the praise and worship team. On Sunday morning, the people see the musicians. On Sunday mornings, the people see the ministers and the pastor. They see the deacons. But what they don't see is the intercessory team that comes in early and pray over the service. What they don't see uh, is the audio and video ministry that comes in early and do sound check and create slides and videos to enhance the service. What they don't see is the facility coordinator, the operations manager, and the administrative assistant handling the business affairs of the church during the week. Uh, they are the ones that are producing, preparing, and preserving the oil in the cellars of ministry, and yet they go unnoticed by many people. But can I say something? Sometimes. Too many of us who are cellar dwellers that prepare oil, even when man don't notice us, we forget that God still sees us. Woo! The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. See, it doesn't matter if man sees you working or not because it's not man that's going to give you your reward. But what matters is that the king sees you and that he knows that he can trust you even when your work is to go unnoticed by people. Another disadvantage of Joe Ash's job is not just that he goes unnoticed, but his job is also uncomfortable. The control room, or this control room, if you will, where Joe Ash is producing oil, is not somewhere that is clean and fresh with wonderful office amenities. You don't have a curate for coffee. It's not air conditioned. It's not a pleasant place. But this cellar was dark. It was damp. And it was deserted. You still want to be used by God? I'm, I'm just checking. Th this is why you have to be careful when you're praying to be used. This is why you have to be careful when you're seeking to be in leadership because all of God's assignments are not pleasant. Some assignments will cause you to be uncomfortable because of decisions that you will have to make. Some assignments will cause you to be uncomfortable because of the hard uh, conversations that you're going to have to have with certain people. 
However, when God calls us to a task, regardless of us being unnoticed or uncomfortable, he is confident that we can handle that task. It doesn't mean that you won't have some dark days. It doesn't mean that your pillow won't get damp with tears. It doesn't mean that you won't be deserted by some friends and family. But in the end, if you just keep on doing the work of the king, you shall receive the king's reward. Jesus said in Revelation chapter number 22 and 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. Understand this. The anointed goes unnoticed and uninvited at times. Woo! See, see when, when, when you don't blend in, okay, let me see if I can say it like the old folks used to say. Uh, when, when you don't drink, smoke, or chew, and you don't run with those that do, ain't that what they used to say? <laughs> They'll leave you out. They, they, they won't invite you to dinner because you're too holy. They won't invite you to dinner because you don't have any balance. No, baby, I got balance, but I also got Jesus. So sometimes, watch this, safeguarding the king's oil means you're going to have to be alone. You're going to have to be okay with not being invited to the party. You're going to have to be all right with not being in the clique. If we're going to safeguard the king's oil, we're going to have to be mindful of our duties that come with the job. Secondly, if we're going to safeguard the king's oil, we have to be mindful of the disadvantage of the job. But then lastly, if we're going to safeguard the king's oil, we have to be mindful of the demands of the job. Joash is in the cellar. He is responsible for the supply of oil. He is working a job that is unnoticed and uncomfortable. And he is not uh, here because he applied for the job, but rather he is on the job because he was appointed the job by the king. And when God calls us to an assignment, he is not interested in our excuses, but he is interested in our effectiveness. Remember I told you that oil in the Old Testament Jewish society was used for almost everything. And because of the necessity of the oil, Joash didn't have time to throw a pity party every time that he realized that he was working in less than favorable conditions. Joash couldn't just quit because everybody else's job seemed better. Joash couldn't just walk away because everybody else gets a pat on the back and not him. See, Joash helps us to see, watch this, if you are really working for the king, or if you're working for the applause of the people. See, if you're working for the applause of the people, sooner or later you're going to have to come out of the media room because you want everybody to see you. If you're working for the applause of the people, you ain't going to stay in line in the background and just keep singing, but you're going to ad lib when you ain't even supposed to. Singing in the background. Ego. Your ego won't let you continue to be unnoticed. But Joash stayed in those same conditions. And watch this. Even as I searched the scriptures, I found that Joash is nowhere on record having a conversation with the king about finding him a different job. He's not looking for anything with better conditions and a more respectable title. Which leads me to assume that Joash was content with where he was. He may not ever be an accountant that is in charge of the king's treasures. And he may not ever uh, be a vine dresser that's in charge of the king's vineyard. He may not ever be an armor bearer that's in charge of the king's safety. And he may not ever be a wise counselor that's in charge of helping the king make wise decisions. But one thing I know is that as long as he is in the cellar and as long as the oil keeps flowing, the kingdom will continue to thrive and the kingdom will continue to advance because it's the oil that makes the difference. And in the same manner that Joash learned to be content with his assignment, 
We need to learn how to be content with where and what the Lord has called us to do. Everybody can't be a pastor. Everybody can't be a worship leader. Everybody can't be a deacon. Everybody can't be an usher. Everybody can't be a trustee. But the good news is there is a place for everybody in the body of Christ. And whatever it is that God calls you to, it is your responsibility to make sure that the oil continues to flow. It is your responsibility to preserve the oil that's on your life. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter number four he says therefore I a prisoner of serving the Lord beg you to lead a life uh, worthy of your calling uh, for you have been called by God uh, always be humble and gentle uh, be patient with each other uh, make an allowance for each other's faults uh, because of your love uh, make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit uh, binding yourselves together with peace uh, for there is one body uh, and one spirit uh, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future there is one one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and one Father of all who is over all, who is in all, and who is living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. This word Christ is not mentioned here as Jesus' last name, but this word Christ is mentioned and defined as the anointed one, which means that along with your special gift comes your special anointing. You have been called by the king and gifted by the king's oil and the anointing you receive was not given just so that you can become popular. I need something to monitor because I can't hear nothing. This anointing that you received was not given just so you can become rich. This anointing you received was not given just so you can have a reputation. The anointing on your life is not to build your ministry, but the anointing is on your life is so that you can affect someone else's life. The Bible says, uh, and it shall come to pass uh, in that day uh, that his burden shall be taken away uh, from off thy shoulder uh, and his yoke from off thy neck uh, and the yoke shall be destroyed uh, because of the anointing. Look at somebody sitting next to you uh, and say, neighbor, uh, there's a strong anointing uh, that's on your life. Uh, whether you're a school teacher or a school custodian, there's an anointing and an assignment on your life. Whether you're a minister or machine operator, there is an anointing on your life. It don't matter if you're an athlete or astronaut, there's an assignment and an anointing that's on your life. Whether you are a soloist or a social worker, there's an anointing and an assignment that's on your life. Your job, your title, or your position may not be as desirable as the next person, but I declare and I decree that whatever and wherever you are serving and whatever you are doing that your oil will continue to flow the bible says whatsoever you do do it with all your heart as unto the lord and not unto man in other words no matter where you find yourself no matter where you're serving your oil should be evident in fact go ahead and get you a sign that says slippery when wet because everywhere you go there's gonna be a dripping of the oil if you find yourself working in a warehouse just put down the sign that says slippery when wet because this place is about to be saturated with oil if you find yourself at the cash register at food line walmart Coles, or neiman marcus put out your sign this says slippery when wet because this store is about to be saturated with oil if you find yourself working in a nursing home funeral home group home get out your sign this says slippery when wet cause this house 
is about to be saturated with oil. I gotta get ready to take my seat. But one more time, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, if you thought castor oil was effective, if you thought baby oil was effective, if you thought motor oil was effective, you ain't seen nothing yet because the oil all my life is about to outdo anything castor oil can do, black seed oil can do, baby oil can do, or motor oil can do, because the oil that's on my life is able to set the captive free. The oil that's on my life is able to bring joy in the midst of sorrow. The oil that's on my life is able to turn your mourning into dancing. The oil on my life is able to lead the lost to the cross so that they may be found. This oil on my life helps me to be effective in whatever God has called me to do. It helps me to remain humble. It helps me to remain hopeful. It helps me to remain faithful. And I, 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 I know that if I remain humble, I, I know that if I remain hopeful, I, I know that if I remain faithful, one day I'll hear him say, well done. Well done. Well done. That good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. But come on up and I'll make you a ruler over much. Look at somebody and say, let the oil Get out your son. Walk with caution. Cause it's slippery. When wet. I'm dripping. With the oil. Drip. Drop. Drip. Drop. I know. You might be sick right now. But drip. Drop. I know. You might have problems right now, but drip, drip, drop, I don't know what you're going through, but drip, drop, the oil is flowing. Sunday morning. It has nothing to do with your title. It has nothing to do with your degree. But God has anointed you for such a time as this. I know you think you at the school to teach, but the school needed some oil. You think you at the department store because they need help but the department store needed some oil. Watch this. He's in a cellar. He's in a dark place. Which lets me know that it's in the dark place that the oil is developed. 
Don't ever discount your dark place. Don't rush God while you're in your dark place. Because you never know what God is trying to do in your life. He's saturating you with oil. He's drenching you with oil. See, you get used to this modern day anointing. Let me say that oil. You, you, you get used to this little dab. And then the cross. It's cute. I ain't gonna do what I need to do because I know your shirt. Turn around. You see that drip? He don't want to just cross your head, but he wants you to drip with oil. And so they didn't just put a cross on you, but they would take the oil and they would pour it. That's why the Bible says it's like the oil that ran down from Aaron's head even to his beard. And God, even as I'm doing this, is pouring something on him right now that's going to drip down to everybody that's under his leadership. Every coach, every player, every family. And you don't have to get jealous of his anointing because the same way I'm pouring him out, God is pouring you out and he's ready to drink you with oil. No longer are you to be intimidated. No longer do you feel like you're not enough. No longer do you feel like it's not on you. No, no issue. God called you. God's anointing you. I don't need more oily people in the church. I need more oily people in the world. Who's not ashamed when somebody say pray for me and get ready to walk up? You say, no, 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 come here. You want to pray? We're going to pray right now. Because right now the oil is flowing. It was his job. Even though he was behind the scenes to make sure the oil flow. God says, I need people who are not interested in making a name for themselves. I'm looking for people who don't need a pat on their back. I'm looking for people who's okay with nobody knowing your name. But all you want is for the kingdom to advance. All you want is for the sick to be healed. All you want is for bad relationships to be restored. All you want is for those in poverty to become prosperous. Slippery when wet. Watch this. The reason why that's so important, slippery when wet means everybody can't help to you. Everybody don't get to get a grasp of you. Watch this, when those people with ulterior motives come to just try and grab on you, you're going to be so oily that you're just going to slide right out of their clutches. Because this level of oil that you're about to receive is getting ready to take you to the next level. Don't be shocked when people that you didn't even think uh, you knew they, they knew your name when they walk up to you on the job and say, can I holler at you? Ain't no need saying who me. God is setting you up. This is not everybody's ministry right here. Some of your ministry on the golf course. Some of it is on the football field. Some of it is on the board that you sit on. Everybody who look like they have it together don't necessarily have it together. And so stop judging people and start being obedient when the Lord tells you to go to somebody because he has an oil that's on you that will deliver them. That's what the anointing is. It breaks the yoke. We've been having it twisted. 
We think the anointing is to give you goosebumps when I preach. You think the anointing is giving you goosebumps when they sing. That is not the anointing. It may be his presence, but the anointing is that ability and that thing that he has called you to. Watch this. That's why on some Sundays, when I can't hit a note like anybody on the choir, but if God say sing this, he ain't looking for my skill set. He's looking for my oil. And while you're trying to find a note, God is trying to find a necessity. Stop backing down. God has called you to be bold in your anointing. I'm not asking you to go on your job and start slinging oil while you're supposed to be working. Keep your job. But the Holy Spirit is about order. And he'll show you how to do what he told you. All you have to do is be willing. Lord, here I am. I'm available to you. Use my hands, use my feet, use my mouth. I surrender. All God wants is a surrender. And only you know what he's called you to do. The king placed each one of them where they needed to be. Not the best friend, not the deacon, but the king told them where they were to labor because he knows the gift that they have. God knows each and every one of your gifts. And watch this, nowhere in there did it say, and the guy from such and such was doing this. Every last one was called by name. God knows exactly who you are, which means he's not making a mistake when he tells you to do what he's telling you to do. I'm done. Y'all can come on up. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. But today, we got to learn to safeguard the king's oil. We got to keep the oil flowing. Church is full of production right now. Church is full of performance right now. The church is resorting to gimmicks and games to get people to come. But if we ever learn to release the oil, we ain't got to give away nothing to get people here. I know that's not good English, but it's the truth. If we let God be God and be obedient to him, there'll be a releasing of the oil like never before. I'm done, stand to your feet all over the building.